Hi, I'm Dr. Sandy McDonald, and we're here at the Earth System Research Laboratory, a part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration located in Boulder, Colorado. I'm standing in front of Science on a Sphere. This is something that I invented for the purposes of science and education. A little bit about how it works. It's simply four projectors around a spherical projection screen. The first spherical projection screen that was ever used this way. What we like to do is display things like the Earth. And we can display anything on the Earth. We can display the clouds, the oceans, the life, the geology. So it's a wonderful way to look at science, both for scientists and for the public. And those are the two applications. Scientists really need to understand the Earth as it really is, or the sun as it really is. And the public does too. The public is faced with very difficult issues, such as what about climate change? What's going to happen? They can understand it better when they are able to see the Earth the way it really looks and to see the changes that scientists anticipate happening. A great place to start with Science on a Sphere is the Earth as it really is. This is the blue marble, which was originally created by NASA, and it shows the clouds, the vegetation, our great blue ocean, the polar caps shining in their whiteness. When we have people come into Science on a Sphere, especially school children, we say, you know, if you're ever an astronaut, this is how the Earth is going to look. Uh, the kids love it, and quite often several of them will tell us that they are going to be an astronaut, and it's good to get ahead on that. So what we like is when you think about the Earth as it really looks, you're thinking about also the science of Earth. What are the clouds going to do? Why is the Earth so bright? Uh, how are our oceans going to change? What is the vegetation going to do? These are all scientific questions that when you see the big, beautiful Earth that really come to people. So it's a great place uh, to start by understanding the Earth as it really looks from outer space. The next data set is the Earth and its clouds. We have geostationary satellites around the Earth, and in Science on a Sphere, we put those together to get the motion of the clouds. It's truly beautiful to see the storms as they track across the mid-latitudes, and then meteorologically, we understand how it works better by seeing those interactions. The public can see how these storms uh, go. They can watch the tropical cyclones. Uh, and they can understand what a complex atmosphere we have. Here we're looking at the Earth's oceans. But we're looking at a special look, namely the actual current speed of the ocean. And when we look at it, we see color-coded the areas of motion are in yellows and greens, and the areas where it's still are in blue. So as we look in the eastern Pacific, we see the strong equatorial current being pushed across the Pacific. For example, uh, Contiki, when the raft was carried across the Pacific, it was actually being carried on this. So this current, which gets carried through Indonesia and out into the Indian Ocean, cannot go through Africa. So it stops and it has to go around the, the African Cape of Good Hope. So what we see when we look at that are little eddies showing the great current flowing into the Atlantic and up into the Caribbean where it creates the loop current. Uh, the loop current is something that's very important for prediction of what a hurricane will do. And it's also the genesis of what we used to call the Gulf Stream. Uh, and it actually moves up the east coast of the United States, across the Atlantic, and warms Europe. So this great current over the whole global ocean is very important for scientific understanding of how our weather and climate system works. So we've talked about the Earth's atmosphere, the beautiful clouds in motion. We've talked about the ocean in motion. Now we're talking about the life of the planet. We're looking at the SeaWIF satellite. 
through time, through the seasons, we can see the northern hemisphere as the leaves die in the fall and the trees drop their leaves, it becomes barren, it becomes snow covered. But as the summer wears on, we see this tremendous explosion of biology. And that biology is not limited to land. The leaves on the land are one thing, but we also, in the CWIF satellite, which is really sensitive to photosynthesis, we're seeing that the ocean, the phytoplankton, change with time too. And in fact, as we look at it, we see actually the deserts of the ocean are right up against the deserts on land. And the areas that are really a riot of life in the ocean are right adjacent to the areas in the uh, higher latitudes that are uh, very densely covered with trees and vegetation. So you have the ring of ice, the ring of life, and the ring of deserts. And finally, uh, around the equator, uh, another ring of life. Uh, life on this planet is the distinguishing characteristic. Uh, we don't know of any other life elsewhere. And one of the things we want to do with our science is really understand life and protect its future on the planet. One of the questions that people have are, what are the human effects on Earth? We can look at this data set and see the human effects are actually very large. We're looking at black carbon, which shows up in a bluish color, and we're looking at the sulfates. And when we look at these, we see several areas on Earth where there's very large uh, amounts of these two chemicals. And we can see them as they move out over the oceans, uh, and we can look at them as they affect the Earth. For example, uh, we can see the black carbon as it comes off of Asia and up into the Arctic. In one of our recent uh, Arctic expeditions, we were able to show that that black carbon is going onto the snow, and it's an affecting the melt there. So scientifically, we understand it better. But really, at a human level, when I look at this, what I see is this tremendous effect that we're having on the planet with the substances that we're putting in the air. And that's really the great question that we all face in the 21st century. What are going to be the effects of humans on our planet? And can we protect our planet from those effects? Now we get to look at something pretty special. And that is the Earth as it has changed over 600 million years. When we look 600 million years ago, the state of Indiana was way in the Southern Hemisphere. And as it went through time, here we are going through the Ordovician, Indiana was actually out on a coastal shelf. And that was the age of shellfish. So it created the limestones that we see in Indiana, the beautiful marble that graces the United States Capitol. And as time goes on, we get into the Devonian period, all at once, the continents are greening up, and we see this dance of continents all at once starting to form a huge continent. We're into the Carboniferous, when the great forests that are buried, uh, which make the coal that's now being burned. So at that time, there were 2,000 parts per million, a whole lot of carbon dioxide in the air. The trees took it out. We're putting it back in. Here we are in the Permian. This is uh, coming on to the time of the greatest extinction in Earth's history. And we see the Atlantic Ocean as it starts to open up. So we're looking at this supercontinent called Pangaea. And we're getting the time of the dinosaurs. We're in Jurassic Park with the great forests from pole to pole. In the middle of the Jurassic, the British Isles were way over by North America. We know geologists found mountains from eastern North America and Scotland that looked like they were the same mountain range. But with time, the British Isles moved eastward and the North American continent moved westward. And through time, we see the separation of the continents. Europe congealing together, the British Isles moving in on the north part of Europe, and the continents coming into their current locations. 
Science on a Sphere is great for educating the public about our planets. A favorite of theirs is Mars. Here we're looking at Mars with its great geological features. The Valles Marineris, this giant valley that's as long as San Francisco to New York. Olympus Mons, a volcano that is three times as high as Mount Everest. And many other features like the Three Sisters and great basins that were hollowed out by giant asteroid impacts. We can understand Mars better by watching it on Science on a Sphere. Another important theme isn't, isn't just the atmosphere that's changing due to human effects. The ocean is changing. Here we started in 1765, and we're looking at the change in the acidity of the ocean. More correctly, the saturation with respect to aragonite, which is closely related to acidity. What we're seeing is as the ocean becomes more acidic, its ability to support key life, like shellfish, is really impacted. The blue colors and the purple colors indicate an ocean that's gotten so acidic that it can't support certain types of shellfish, something that we humans have got to think about and try to mitigate. One of the most important things our scientists are doing is trying to understand the future of Earth as our greenhouse gases change. Here we're looking at a model created by the Hadley Center in Britain. This model starts in 1870 and it goes through time assuming the A1B scenario. That's an increase of carbon dioxide. What we see is that as we get into the 21st century, a significant warming starts to take place. And it's not uniform. It's actually much warmer over the continents. It's also much warmer over the poles. And where we end up is the continents in the polar regions are so much warmer that it's very dangerous to our life and to our human future. Here we're looking at the night lights of Earth. Our global civilization is shining brightly out into the night. A question for us is, what is the impact of the large energy use that humans have? This is something that we need to understand scientifically and that the people of Earth need to understand. Here we're looking at the Earth and what appears to be bees flying over the Earth are actually commercial aircraft. Each little yellow element is a commercial aircraft. And we've gone through an entire day of air traffic. What we see is that as the sun rises, the continents fill up with these little bees. And as the day goes on, you see great streams of aircraft going from continent to continent across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. This is one more indication of how our civilization has become closer, and yet at the same time, it raises the question. We have our natural world. We have the oceans and the atmosphere, and then we have the human effects, all of which are portrayed beautifully in Science on a Sphere. And we want, as part of our education of the public, for people to see both of those, the big effects of people, in our natural world as we want to preserve it. Our educational goal is really the core of what we hope to see Science on a Sphere do.